Tom Ellis was a sailor. He was said to be a very happy man when his ship, the Eliza White, was moored at Hamilton to the west of Lake Ontario. He had been a sailor since a young age, and now in the early 1900s, he worked as a deckhand on the Eliza White, a schooner that carried cargo around the ports of the Great Lakes. On this day, as a vessel was in port, the Eliza White's crew, including its captain, had gone ashore. With no desire to join them, Tom Ellis decided to remain on board. He passed the time reflecting on the tasks ahead and reading a book in his cabin. As he read, something in the periphery of his vision caught his attention. When he turned, there, standing in the cabin, was the apparent spectre of a woman. When she appeared to suddenly realise that Tom was aware of her, she slowly walked towards him. When she stopped, a fearful Tom Ellis felt the air around him turn cold. He knew what he was witnessing but could hardly believe it. It was the ghost of a woman, transparent and unnaturally white. She looked straight at me, Tom Ellis later attested. I have never seen such horror and terror and fear and pain in anyone's eyes as I did in hers. She was wringing her hands as though in agony. He bolted from the cabin and fled the ship. As he passed some of his fellow crew members on the street, he barely coherently exclaimed that he would never sail on the Eliza White again, and according to the story, he never did. It's unknown who the woman was, whether she was the bearer of bad news, there to heed a warning, or a long passed away passenger. It was a few days before Christmas Eve 1996 when Jane Prokiskova was watching television at her home in the village of Plumlov in the east of the Czech Republic. She was alone, her husband out at work. When the film she was watching came to an end, Jane wandered over to the living room window and watched as the snow slowly fell. This is when she noticed footprints in the fresh snow which led up to the house. She assumed it was her husband and waited for the imminent sound of the key in the lock. There was nothing, maybe the ringing of the bell if he had locked himself out, but there was no sound. She apprehensively approached the front door, opened it and peered out. No one was there. The footprints ended at the door's threshold. Whoever they belonged to had not turned away, nor entered the house. Not to Jane's knowledge, anyway. This is when she panicked. What if someone had entered the house, she thought, but she hadn't heard anything at all. Too afraid to wander deep into the building, or upstairs, she returned to the living room window, opened it, and listened out for her husband's return. There was no sound except for the light falling of the snow. A few minutes passed before she saw her husband in the distance. She called out to him excitedly and pointed to the footprints. He was understandably puzzled until he entered the house and she explained the situation more clearly. Now both concerned, they armed themselves with kitchen knives and searched the house. When they were satisfied that there was no intruder, they returned to the front of the house to follow the footprints back to their source, or as far as the couple would care to go. They followed the deep prints across the road and into a field. In the field there was a frozen pond on which the footprints continued, so they followed. Then, as they neared the centre of the pond, the footprints ended. Looking around in astonishment, they saw that there were no other tracks or signs of movement to or from any direction. Jane and her husband said that no one had ever died in their house, and they didn't know of anyone who had drowned in that pond, recently or historically. But the couple were sure that they had been visited by something supernatural that day. I personally wonder if the snow continued to fall, were the earlier footprints simply covered up. However, that doesn't explain Jane's claim that the footprints simply ended at her front door. Little more than half a mile west of the village of Clarencefield in Dumfries, Scotland, lies 120 acres of wood and secluded land. Within that land stands Comlingan Castle. The structure dates back to the late 15th or early part of the 16th centuries. It was built by the noble Murray family of Cockpool. In fact, the castle stayed in the same family right up until 1984. Like many ancient castles the world over, 
Kumlongan has ghost stories tied to it. The one I will be delving into today is that of the Green Lady, an apparition reportedly seen by many a visitor for centuries now. The apparition is thought to be the remnants of Marion Carruthers of Musseld, the daughter of Simon Carruthers and Agnes Murray. Marion, along with her sister Janet, were heir to their father's land, which was considerable. When their father died in 1548, Queen Mary of Scotland granted warden marriage of Marion and Janet over to Sir James Douglas of Drumlinrig. This essentially meant that he took role of their father and would decide on whom they would marry when they came of age. It was Marion's fear that she would be forced to marry into James Douglas's own clan so that he could secure the late Simon Carruthers estate for himself. This was precisely Douglas's plan, but in the meantime, it's said that he kept Janet and Marion within the confines of his home, unable to venture out and live their lives. When the sisters reached the age of 16 and 17 respectively, they, with the help of their uncle Charles Murray of Cockpool, wrote to the Lords of Council, a group of noblemen appointed by Queen Mary. They declared that they were lodging a protest against Sir James Douglas, stating that he was keeping them in, quote, subjection and thraldom, meaning that they were essentially living the lives of slaves. This protest did little to help Janet and Marion, however. In 1561, Janet reluctantly agreed to marry a man of James Douglas's choosing, therefore signing her share of her father's land over to him. Marion Carruthers refused to be controlled in this way. In 1564, Marion appeared before Queen Mary and signed her share of her inheritance over to her uncle Charles Murray. James Douglas challenged this decision on the grounds that he had been granted warden marriage of Marion and that this made Charles Murray's ownership documents illegal. Marion's sister Janet and her husband sided with Douglas. Ultimately, Queen Mary decided that Charles Murray's ownership of the land was void and it was agreed that in order to maintain any ownership, she needed to marry a man of James Douglas's choosing. Some versions of the story say that Douglas intended for Marion to marry a man by the name of John McMath. Another version says that the intended groom was James Douglas himself. Either way, now driven to heights of distress, legend has it that Marion threw herself from one of the towers of the Comlingdon Castle. Another version of the story goes that the family of the man she was due to marry followed her to the castle, gained entry and threw her from the roof. Whatever the case may have been, her death was deemed a suicide, so she was denied a Christian burial. Marion's ghost has allegedly been seen and heard within the castle walls. Those who have claimed to witness her said that they hear her sobbing. There is a photograph of what is said to be the partially formed ghost of Marion Carruthers, also known as the Green Lady, in the Great Hall of Comlingan Castle. On August 3, 1860, Irish newspaper The Armour Guardian printed a story told to them by a reader from Cornwall, England. The man did not give his name, but the story he told was not only hard to believe, it was something like a 21st century horror film. The man in question, who was said to be a very wealthy man, had a live-in butler along with a young servant boy. One day the butler came to his employer with the bad news that the night before, the house had been broken into and burgled. Not only that but the servant boy had disappeared. A large amount of family crested plates had also been stolen from the kitchen, he said. There was a manhunt for those responsible and an award offered for any information. As time went on though, and no clues were found, it was assumed that the young boy was implicated in the robbery and had made himself scarce. As time went on and no information was forthcoming, the matter was almost forgotten. Then one day the butler told his employer of his plans to marry, move away from Cornwall and open an inn. The wealthy man was sorry to see his butler go after so long together. He helped him with the move all he could and wished him and his future wife well. One night the butler's employer was awoken by what he claimed to be an apparition of the lost servant boy at the foot of his bed. He was beckoning the man forward. Thinking it was no more than a dream, he took no notice and drifted off to sleep. The following night he saw the boy again. This time he looked eager for his former master to follow him. The man noted that if the same were to happen for a third night running, then he would follow the boy. And so it was, on the third night, 
the boy appeared to him again. This time the man rose from the bed and dressed himself quickly. As he did, he said the apparition glided past him towards the closed bedroom door which he passed through. He followed the boy through the upper floor, down the stairs, and outside to the back garden lawn. There the servant boy pointed to the foot of a large oak tree. His master, to assure himself that he was in full possession of his senses, drew his pocket knife and handkerchief. He thrust the knife into the bark of the tree and wrapped his handkerchief around the knife. With the phantom now gone, he went back to the house and returned to bed. The next day he called his gardener and asked him to bring the spade. The gardener dug into the ground at the foot of the oak tree. After a few minutes of digging, he unearthed the skeleton of what was clearly a young person, along with an empty basket and a linen cloth. When an investigation was made, it wasn't long before suspicion fell upon the former butler. His house was searched, and several expensive plates bearing his former employer's crest were seized, besides other stolen items. According to the storyteller, his former butler confessed to killing the boy to ward off suspicion of the theft from himself, and was duly hanged for his crime. I did check to see if the crime detailed in the story actually happened. As no date was given for the alleged events, it was impossible to narrow it down to a decade, let alone a year, and the events described in the 1860 edition of the Armour Guardian weren't necessarily recent to that date. The storyteller here could have been referring to dates that occurred years or even decades before, or maybe the story was complete fabrication. The very needle in a haystack type search I did, did not come up with any historical stories of murderous butlers or dead servant boys buried beneath trees. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen. In 1902, British newspaper the Preston Herald included a ghost story in its September the 27th edition. The story was entitled Real Ghost Story from a Pit Village and referred to the County Durham village of Shotton, or more specifically Shotton Colliery, which lies to the northwest of the village. Calling it, quote, bare, dreary and uninviting, the Preston Herald refers back to a time when the place had fallen into a state of disrepair and had been abandoned by its people following the closing of its coal mine in the late 19th century. The mine workers and their families had moved away. The coal mine, as was so often the case back then with villages in Britain, was the staple of its income and the inhabitants' lifeline. However, the mine was reopened a few years later and the tide of prosperity turned for the little village. Gradually, the dilapidated houses were repaired and inhabited once again in 1901, one of the houses, the last one on Chapel Row, was moved into by a family named Lamb. The Lamb family had only been living in the Chapel Row house for a little more than a month when they began to be disturbed nightly by the banging and shaking of the front door and constant rattling of the latch. It may sound like an unremarkable case of bumps in the night, easily explained away by the weather or a practical joker, but even in the mildest of conditions, when Mr. Lamb would approach and open the door, he would always open it to an empty lane. If there was a practical joker at the door every night, he was somehow able to make himself scarce in the blink of an eye. Watch was rigorously kept, but no one was ever seen at the time of the disturbances. Even on the odd occasion the ground was covered in snow, no footprints were ever detected, but the disturbances remained. The family were in a state of panic and were, for a while, afraid to speak to neighbours about their experiences. When they did speak, no one else was ever aware of it or able to shed any light on it. The disturbances usually happened shortly after midnight and throughout the night intermittently until about 5am. It wasn't until 1902 when Mr Lamb's son, a young man of 20 years, was heading back home from work one night at 11 o'clock he said he saw a shadow glide away from the house. He followed the black form, which he said was devoid of human or animal shape, around the corner and watched as it crossed the road. As he watched, he was afraid to move any closer. Walking backwards now, and about to turn away to run home, the lamb boy hesitated just long enough for the shadow to turn its head. The young man said that he now saw two red eyes in a black void that looked like a human head. If the accounts are true, it sounds very much like a practical joker or enemy of the family were at play. 
However, the Preston Herald, keen to present it as a genuine ghost story that could not be denied, wrote, This is a plain, unvarnished statement of fact, devoid of theories. No reasonable explanation of the proceedings, either on material or supernatural grounds, has been advanced. The root of the matter, however, may disclose as remarkable a ghost story as the most romantic novelist has ever concocted. When I looked for the Shot and Colliery house on Chapel Row where the Lamb family once lived, I found out by comparing these two maps, one from 1896 and one from 2023, that Chapel Row and its surrounding lanes have since long gone. In 1994, author Holly Nadler wrote a book called The Haunted Island, Ghost Stories from Martha's Vineyard. In her introduction, she explains that she probably would never have believed in ghosts had it not been for an incident that occurred during her college years in the 1970s. She spoke of a dear friend of hers named Jane from Estes Park, Colorado. Jane sadly died in a car crash during their college years in California Holly promised to keep her friend's memory alive and to imagine that her spirit was close to her at all times. One way in which Holly did this was to play Jane's favourite records in her old apartment in Pasadena. Holly would play those records for Jane before she left for class in the mornings, leaving the record player running after she had left the apartment. When thinking of what record to play one morning, Holly remembered Jane's love of James Taylor's Sweet Baby James album, particularly the song Fire and Rain. But in her haste to get ready and to leave on time that morning, Holly forgot to put the record on. When she remembered, she was determined to play it when she returned home. At the end of the day, when Holly did return, she stacked up the records for the evening. She said she placed Vivaldi's Four Seasons, a Scott Joplin record and an album by the Stone Ponies. But again, Holly had forgotten the James Taylor record for Jane. Walking to the bathroom to the sounds of Vivaldi's Four Seasons, Holly ran the bath and got in. It wasn't until the Scott Joplin album was coming to an end that she realised she had forgotten to include James' record as part of the evening's lineup. As the Joplin record faded out, Holly was about to exit the bath and correct her mistake. The Stone Ponies album was next. Expecting the voice of Linda Ronstant to begin at any moment, a chill ran through Holly as the familiar guitar chords played and the voice of James Taylor filled the apartment with the words... Just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. It was not only the correct side, but Jane's favourite song, Fire and Rain. Holly recalls that she was considerably shaken when she checked to see if she had made a mistake. She saw the Stone Ponies, Vivaldi and Scott Joplin record sleeves resting against the player where she had placed them, yet the James Taylor record was playing. The blue and grey jacket was nowhere to be found. <laughs> 